Pattern Tactics by Impossible Numbers First published on the 8th of June, 2019 Part 1 The stallions had gone on ahead, despite Stygian's ums and ahs. Like Meadowbrook said, put a stallion in a one-pony town and he would soon gravitate towards the nearest tavern. This one creaked. It looked like it had been erected overnight using wood rot and any sawdust that hadn't collapsed yet. Hardly anyone remained in town anyway. The stallions have seen maybe four or five ponies milling about, and the tavern only had half a dozen patrons despite this being happy hour. Not that this ever stopped Rockhoof singing. Rockhoof could sing for a whole troop of ponies. Any tavern with him in it automatically seemed crowded. Now, the four stallions linked four limbs and swayed, spilling their drinks with a logistical effort involved. Oh! began Flash Magnus, leading them into another song. I'll march o'er hills, I'll fly o'er vale, I'll sing through wind and grind through gale. I'll wear my bones, my armor torn, I'll weather cries of hate and scorn. All Tartarus I'll face for you, my second soul, my love so true, my second soul, my love. So, boom, rock of true, howled Starswell. Even for the collapse of laughs and hearty backslaps, they noticed suspicious eyes watching them from the bar. The rest of the tavern held their silence, their drinks and drunk. Stygian was the first to recover. This wasn't the first time drinking with the lads, but he still insisted on a thimble full of orange squash. He'd mostly joined in to blend in. Last time he tried cider, it had hurt his throat. A sterling countertenor, sir, he said, to keep up their spirits. Alone of the group, he couldn't hold his smile any better than he could hold his drink. Thank you, Stygian, Starswell harumphed, his signal that pleasantries were well and truly over. As it happens, I used to be in the old stallion's choir of the old Canterlot University, what? In those days, you learned your C-sharps from your D-flats quick as a whip. The old master diatonic wasn't shy about correcting an own tongue. Oh dear me, no. Stygian sighed, but very quietly. The bearded sorcerer was gearing up for another back-in-my-day speech. If Stygian heard any more, his memoirs would be full of nothing but back-in-my-day speeches. Yes, sir, he began, speaking quickly. And while we seem to have a brief respite, sir, I've assessed our current situation and taken the liberty of considering several new battle strategies. Oh, have yourself a pint, Stygie! Rockhoof shoved one of his many tankers over the table. It'll put hairs on your chest. More hairs than usual, added Flash cheerfully. I drink enough, and you might even grow a chest to put them on, too. Both he and Flash elbowed each other and threw back a quaff of cider. Some of it splashed on the floor. Stygian smiled for fair sakes, but deep down, his memory added the joke to a list. He glanced at the bar. Sitting on stools, the other patrons nursed their drinks and glared over at the party like misers expecting thieves. Even the bar stallion had a hoof under the counter, and while Stygian hadn't been in many taverns in his life, his tutors had largely discouraged frivolous pursuits of any kind, up to including smiles. He kept his ears open, and some of the things he'd learned was that a bar stallion with a grim view of his clientele was most likely a friend of some useful club kept handily within reach, preferably a big, no-nonsense club with a nail in it. There was no doubt the sirens had been through here. In a town this small, the bitter hatreds of a few dozen ponies would have made for slim pickings, but in any case, he learned some towns didn't need much excuse to start a tavern brawl. Sometimes, merely existing was enough to offend them. It wasn't as if his friends blended in. Starswell's bells jangled on his robes whenever he moved, and he had a certain way of sitting that suggested anyone nearby was automatically a servant. Flash Magnus's armor clanked and groaned under the rust. 
and Rockhoof didn't need any fancy clothing to stand out. He projected a sort of anti-blending infield with his sheer presence, and a large stallion who didn't wash the good, honest earth off his coat soon had another sheer presence of his own anyway. Um, sirs, Stygian began, trying not to breathe too deeply. Tell me, Captain Magnus, said Starthrow, whence did you come upon that delightful little ditty? Sang it on the campaign to the Griffin Kingdom, sir. Flash Magnus ripped off a salute, half mocking, half earnest. Commander Ironhead disapproved, sir, so we sang it at every chance we got, just for him. When he winked, Flash Magnus could make even Rocco blush. But after the first few raids, we stopped singing it out of respect, sir. Why is that? said Star Swirl. Sounds rather uplifting, I think. Yes, sir. But it's a uh, one thing to sing it just to rile up a stuffy old commander. It's another to sing it when he knows his friends won't be singing it anymore. Oh? And why is that? Stygian wished he wasn't sitting right next to Star Swirl. He was a living proof of that embarrassment was contagious. Sometimes a sorcerer could be so dense, given the fabric of space and time to mess about in, he'd run ring universes around you. But a hint as to anything involving other ponies, and he always, despite his best efforts and understanding, found a way to soil it. Yet Flash Magnus's brief frown vanished as quickly as it came. He'd gotten used to the sorcerer's density. On account of all the war and so on, sir, he said. Not everyone gets out alive, sir. Oh, I see. Yes, said Starswell hurriedly. Pardon me. And that was another problem with Starswell. In his own mind, he was never really wrong. Just mildly not quite correct, and then the mistake hadn't happened, and they were all supposed to move on. Stygian wondered how the bearded stallion's tutors had treated him to get him like this, or even if it had been the other way around. Fortunately, Flash Magnus raised his tankard to show good spirits. It's a good song amongst friends, sir, but you have to pick your company with care if you see what I mean. I've known it to break a stallion at many a tavern. That poor stallion, said Rockhoff. No, I meant... I. I can well what you meant. The mighty helm seen many a good soul fall to arrow and blade, and worse things besides. You learn fast to get your good cheer where you can. Flesh Magnus raised his tankard higher, more emphatically. Qui dixit mihi verum, et dixit mihi dolores in moris. A master of languages, Stygian raised an eyebrow, but said nothing. That's rather grim, what? said Starswirl. Also a master of languages but less prone to keeping his mouth shut. The tankard came down. Life in the army, sir. Beside him, Rockhoof looked down at a forest of tombs, the tankards being resting places of now departed spirits. And ciders, ales, bitters, meat, and whatever else had taken his fancy. Time for another drink. The stool groaned under his rising bulk. You've already had eight, said Flash, goggling. Aye, well, I had to kick off with summer, didn't I? You're paying this time, said Starswell at once. Oh, you tight old scudder. The rest of us would like a little insurance if things don't go well in the next town, Rockhoff. Away with you, you old bag of bones. This fight's as good as fought. That, said Starswell, tapping the table meaningfully, is what you said last time. And I'll be right yet. I was just one tone early saying it. In two towns, Flash Magnus muttered, in three towns, in four towns, and Rockhoof rounded on him. And several hundred pounds, her blooming earth stallion does not round quickly. Stygian practically heard the floorboards grind under his boulder hooves. That a point you want to make, Flash? Then make it face to face. I'm just being realistic said Flash Magnus, who to Stygian's amazement looked up about so much as a flicker of a flinch. If the sirens were that easy to defeat, we wouldn't be here now talking about them. When I get me shovel or the ugly fish heads. Yes, Rockhoof, only we have yet to reach that point. We know our strengths. We know how to duck and dodge our tricks. 
They have tactical advantages enough to kick our haunches up the river and back, as my old sergeant used to say. Stygian, who had some idea of how Pegasi usually spoke, wondered which particular quoted words Flash Magnus was censoring here. Calmly, Flash Magnus stood up and downed his pint before turning to Rock of Skull Glare. So we can't say this fight's as good as fought, otherwise we'll end up arguing all over again at the next tavern too. The trouble was that Rockhoof didn't back down. He didn't have the mental headspace for backing down. Backing down was some pony else's problem. Stygian held his breath. Surely, though, even a soldier like Flash wasn't going to pick a fight with someone who carved valleys with his bare hooves solely so the bards could sing about it and spread his name. Luckily, Flash Magnus did have the mental headspace for backing down. He called it tactical retreat. He sat down. You're right about one thing. There's still hope left. That's what I thought, rumbled Rockhoof and dust rained down from the rafters. This is only a game to me. I can knock those scun out sight and senseless all of my tod with my legs hogtied and my eyes blindfolded. I'd knock them so far yonder they'd become three new stars in the sky. Fine, fine, I believe you. Go get your pick-me-up. Well, I just wanted it said. Storm clouds moving away, Rockhoof tramped up to the bar. When he made his order, he was curt and sullen. Not for the first time, Stygian wished the girls would show up. Flash Magnus was all right, but Starsworld's aura burning corona-like power made him, Stygian, feel like a foal at the grown-up stable, whereas Rockhoof had a way of looming and booming that worried his sensibilities. He'd spent too much time indoors to feel really comfortable with stallions who could snap him like a twig. Star Swirl glanced at his drink morosely. I suppose it is time we reconsidered our approach. One moment. Shouldn't we wait for the mares to join us? said Flash. Ignoring him, Star Swirl let up his horn. Thinking fast, Stitchy grabbed his own thimble and yanked it off the table a second before the air popped. The world in front of him sizzled and a gigantic map landed. Drinks rattled and rolled across the floor. Stygian backed off a little. The map projected well beyond the table, its sides almost razor-edged. Hums and muzzle-rubbing soon followed. Starswell examined the map as though reading a fascinating old tome. Hey! snapped a voice from the bar. Stygian's heart sank at the sight of the bar stallion. The stallion's leg ducked under the counter and Stygian shrank back at the thought of a solid block of wood hurtling towards him. What do you think you're doing? said the bar stallion. If only Star Swirl had looked mildly apologetic or even rattled off a curt apologies to placate him. But Star Swirl barely treated his friends with much courtesy. If that old nobody had no chance. Good sir, he said, clipping the air with his irritation. This concerns the fate of Equestria and all its subjects. Kindly do not interrupt me while I'm working. Then he switched off the mild inconvenience and had eyes only for the map. Sigeon wondered how quickly he could bolt for the door. Part of him felt no shame in leaving his friends behind, after all, fighting with their department. But part of him kept him glued to his chair, and unfortunately it was an ancient animal part of him that was too scared to dare move an inch for fear of becoming a target separated from his herd. A few of the patrons scraped stools back. Fights might be popular in these parts, especially after a siren attack. It was Rockhoof who responded first. Any stallion lays a hoof on him. That stallion is a dead stallion. One of the nearest patrons looked him up and down, or at least up and further up. That so? And who the hell do you think you are? Oh no, murmured Stygian, the words making a dash for freedom. Somehow, Rockhoof found enough inner matter to swell fervor. Spikes of rage broke out all around his body. He darkened and reddened as much as old iron. I am the strength of the mighty helm, he said. He didn't bellow. He didn't need to. Bellowing would have been a whisper in such deep confidence. 
I have cut through the rock of ages with nothing but my trusty shovel. I am skull grinder of earth, scourge of the griffins, slayer of dragons. My shovel is sword beater. With it I have carved valleys and raised mountains with my passing. I am the fire of fate, bringer of tides and fear from the highest heavens to the deepest seas. Sijin almost clapped, but that would have drawn unwanted attention to himself. The other patrons stared, and the nearest one drew himself up, scowling harder. Then Stygian noticed a hammer tied to the stallion's belt. Good grief, he thought. Another warrior. Blavers, said the patron, his hammer shaking. You tell Ironsmith you can shape rock and kill dragons. You wear your girl's blouse. I'm the king of iron. I eat diamonds for breakfast, lunch, and supper. I found the titans who made the world and ground them into dust and ate their ashes and swallowed their might. I've seen worlds that make this one a speck of dust and I've bitten the fear of Equestria and her champion right into their bones. I'm Ironsmith, forger of worlds, creator of destiny. I defy the defier of fate and make him eat his shovel. It was... Some of the finest nonsense Stygian had ever heard. He could tell that, despite the swelling anger and bursting pride, Rockworth was ever so slightly impressed. Around them, the patrons watched with an air of mild confusion tinged with manly respect. Of course, Earth Stallions took a bout of boasting very seriously in some parts, Overruling even a full battle and definitely overruling a mere tavern punch-up. Perhaps a understanding could be found, warrior to warrior? Is that all, ya maudlin? Rockhoof took a deep breath and the pressure in the room dropped so fast that Stygian's ears hurt. A pansy conjurer like me make beardy could poke his head in a dozen worlds afore you woke up to this one. But I conquer them before you put your pink pom-pom slippers on. Oh aye, you gobsmiter. Aye, name your greatest feast and no blethers, you son of a milkmaid. Ladies first, you garden and gildin. How many volcanoes you fought in one with that tinkering stools you call a hammer, you wee pixie pony? How many dragons you dug wee pretty flowers for with that plowshare, you daft hen? Stygians lay back while the insults flew. At least Rockhoof had made a good distraction. Flash Magnus dug down to pick up his spilled drink while Star Swirl muttered and examined the map. Neither of them seemed tense anymore now that the fight had, as it were, been put in two mouths and left to get on with it. Even the other patrons lost interest. Hope fluttered inside Stygian's chest. Perhaps the siren's effects were wearing off already. That meant they hadn't lingered long, and that meant they might be running scared. At last, they could press home their advantage. But as he watched Star Swirl mutter to himself, he wondered if there was still some slight, slim chance that they might miss this golden opportunity to not get their haunches kick up the river and back. Part 2 the door whined as it opened. Even the hinges had rusted here in this cursed town. Three mares stepped in. At once, most of the company straightened up except for Rockhoof and his current disputant. Not that pretty mares were rare in backward places like this one, but usually they were built along solid, child-bearing, sheep-carrying, barrel-shouldering lines whereas the first to enter was Somnambula. Probably none of the ponies here knew what exotic was or how to spell it, but Somnambula's rich eyelashes, Somnambula's pristine headdress, Somnambula's very see-through clothing all spoke of exotic right down to the bone. She even walked with the kind of sinuous stride that made ponies who'd lived slap-bang in the middle of wet fields all their lives, dream of palm trees and white sandy beaches and the sweet flesh of coconuts. 
someone actually wolf whistled as she passed. Ever, the traditionalist, Flash Magus, removed his helmet and stood up as she approached. Nil desperandum, Somnambula. The room brightens with your approach already. Enough of that, you old soldier, she said, and the slinking way she spoke suddenly made Stygian regret years spent cooped up in his private library. Although, if you're paying, I'll have a honey stick by Thunder Rocks. I'm afraid your taste exceed this establishment, Somnambula. But I'm sure I could slake your first with a humble mead. Star World waved them both off like gnats. Silence, please. I'm concentrating. In the end, Somnambula nodded and took Flash Magnus's seat while he flapped over to the bar with a fresh surge of haste. Meanwhile, Stygian watched a second mayor swagger in. Mage Betterbrook noticed him, beamed, and waved so hard she almost stumbled. At the bar, Rockhoof and the other warrior, Ironsmith, was it, had abandoned words and were now trying to flex their muscles. Shirts threatened to rip. The patrons, who could tear their eyes away from Sinambula, cheered the two combatants indiscriminately. Seeing this, Meadowbrook barked a laugh and hurried over. Don't stretch too far, Rocky. Y'all recollect how long it took me to sew up the last one, you hear? All stallions began smoothing down their manes and grinning at her approach. Meadowbrook swept into every room as though a bell at the ball. Besides, she had a way of beaming at ponies that made even scar-battled thugs turn into complete gentle cult. Oh, Meadowbrook, mumbled Rockhoof, and it astonished Stygian how someone who looked like the world's hardiest battering ram could sound so sheepish. Don't go into that, no? Uh, I bet you that's the best stitchin, ma'am, rumbled Ironsmith, nudging his colleagues. I can, me wife, can patch a hole worth for Drake's bottom. Ain't you sweet? I'm more into the stitchin' wounds business, darling. Meadowbrook wrapped the bar for attention. But when you're traveling with the big boys, you learn fast someone's got to do the laundry work, and glamorous as it may be. And as for the smell... Sanitation clearly needs to be in this season. Am I right on the money, or what? Really don't go into that now, Rockhoff squirmed. It sounded like a rhinoceros struggling against a leather harness. Around him, the other stallions' comments outvoted him. Aye, cleanliness is next to princessiness. Tis a fine thing to have the laundry under our experts' hooves. No joke. Aye, a fine thing, a very fine thing. Males these days just ain't a patch on the old ways. Well, Meadowbrook smiled, a mutter among children. There ain't no mistaking you darlings for anything but true gentle colts. Shame we have to meet under such dark clouds. I've been tending the blood and guts all day, and let me tell you, healing ain't a dainty little job. I could rightly enjoy a dram of brandy. And how in the hell are you going to pay for... Rocco began. At once, the cry rang out. I'll pay you out, last. Get or I saw her first. One dram of brandy coming up. I'll make it two drams and the finest oatmeal money can buy. Cremons, I'll make it three drams and a hot meal and a slap of breakfast to die for come sunrise. Amid the shouts and brief, sudden, but gentlemanly scuffles, a lady was present after all. The third of the mares finally made her way over to their table. At once, Stygian stood up. My lady, my little scholar, groaned the elderly tones for the wrinkled smile. I wouldn't take your seat from you. I've been saving it for you, my lady. Thought you might like to sit next to Starswell, my lady. This wasn't just gallantry on Stygian's part. Not that he'd ever say a word against the great Starsworld of Bearded, sorcerer among sorcerers, master of the subtle arts, but it would be nice to have a negotiator between him and the old Rambler, and few ponies were more open to negotiation than Mistmane. The other advantage, of course, was that Mistmane knew magic too. She'd trained at one of the harshest schools of magic in Eastern Equestria. Even Starsworld watched her cautiously and rarely talked over her. 
Stygian was an observer, though, and he couldn't help noticing the way Mist made a look at the other two mares, one accepting her meat and deep in conversation with a flustered Flash Magnus, the other happily surrounded by fighting stallions and more brandy glasses that could fit in a chicken coop. No one had looked twice at the old biddy bringing up the rear. It didn't matter if that Mist Mane was, in fact, younger than the other two. She had more wrinkles and bone deformations than a wise old elephant left too long in the sun. Sigeon wondered, not for the first time, if the young sorcerer secretly regretted her rash, if noble sacrifice. Beauty spent, once done, never rescinded. Starstroll cleared the irritation out of his throat. Now that all of us are here, we can finally concentrate on a matter of genuine import. We found a place to rest for the night, Starstroll, said Miss Mayne. Balderdash, we're staying at the tavern. Pardon my frankness, but we've seen what the sirens have done here. I don't think it would be wise to stay here for long. Some of the citizens are starved and crazed, the poor things. Stygian pulled up two more stools, one for Somnambula, who gave him a dignified nod and sat down at last. One intended for Meadowbrook, when she could get out of the eager-to-please scrum. He himself had no problem standing. Scholars didn't mind minor discomfort, and he had to confess he didn't feel quite on par with the rest of the company. Not yet. Meaning what, Miss Main? said Starswirl, but wearily. Stygian heard the old sorcerer weighing up his chances against the eastern unicorn whose mane flowed and flexed against an ethereal wind, even indoors. There might be some desperate souls willing to rob us in the night. So, a simple force field spell will solve that problem. We have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. They do. Stars will. They're angry and desperate and confused. Some of them fled when we approached, and Meadowbrook offered them food. All the more reason, said Starswell relentlessly, to develop our battle strategy tonight. Mist Main's sigh was a dewdrop of sadness, small, fragile, and yet reflecting so much of the world around it that Stygian wondered if he was blessed to have heard it, or cursed never to forget what truths it had revealed. He decided to take a step forwards. What you mean, sir, if I may be so bold, is that we should move for the sake of the inhabitants. The siren attack must have come as a shock to a town as small as isolated as this one, sir. If we waltz in and erect barriers, we might be treated as another enemy from the outside. Young Cold, I still don't see we're a complication in the current chaos, sir added Stygian, who wished Stars to World wouldn't say young colt like they were at school. And these ponies don't understand the wider context, sir. If we move on quickly, the inhabitants might recover enough to focus on calming down and rebuilding their homes. If we stay, or worse, fight them, we'd only stress them all the more. Despite his adult pride, Stygian took Miss Main's small smile warmly, as though accepting a gold star from a teacher Miss Main even resembled one of his old tutors from when he was knee-high and full of beans, eyes shining as they saw the future. Very well, star snapped Starswell. What do you propose? Somnambula fended off Flash Magnus's sweet nothings long enough to say, I found an old temple some way into the dark woods. Flash and I could travel as the crow flies as they see the country. But the land has hills, and the forests are muddy and difficult to walk. Sounds like swamp country, said Flash Magnus. Meadowbrook was born in a swamp, and old Rockhoof can walk through a glacier. You unicorns might have a tough time, I suppose, sir. Huh? But if us two carried... The very idea, Starstool's heart jangled as he turned his snout up at the suggestion. A sorcerer can find his own way without anything as undignified as an airdrop. Or her way, said Miss Main. Oh, her way, yes, added Starswell carelessly. Stygian held his breath. One of them was going to mention him. Any second now, without his prompting. Any second now. Flash Magnus hovered over the map. 
In the distance, Meadowbrook laughed her girly high laugh and said, Now a shindig I'd sample any day. Perhaps one you fine stallions could show a girl how to cut a rug around these parts. Any takers? Or no one would mention him. In case it helped, Stygian coughed loudly. Only Miss May looked up. The other three still stared at the map. Those sirens are trying to mislead us, said Somnambula, rubbing her chin. I doubt it, murmured Star Swirl, his hoof tracing a spiral over the map. See, they're working their way to the heart of Equestria. Simple spiraling tactic. That means they first eat up the negative energy from the outlying regions, where there are no major cities and the defenses are much weaker. Then they build up their strength for the larger settlements near the middle. Canterlot and Neverfree will be the endgame, you mark my words. So, what do you propose? Simple. Instead of following on their wake, we anticipate them. Lay a trap for them, let's see. Star Soul's hoof swirled over the map as though stirring a large coffee. Then he slammed it down. There! Stygian squinted. Oh well, if he didn't put his best hoof forwards. Rambling Rock Ridge, sir, he said. There's no settlement there. No, Starthold's eye twinkled, a sign of genius at work, or so Stygian charitably assumed. However, it lies on the direct path between Canterlot and Everfree. The sirens need to finish this. They've had the elements of surprise so far, but word spreads. Forces are rallying. The army is being called back to defend the cities, which means more military might is concentrating on the center. Starthrow glanced up. Isn't that right, Captain Magnus? Flash Magnus nodded. Standard siege preparation, sir. So far, the army is treated these as minor skirmishes, the idiots. I told them sirens don't go down easy. Yes, yes, that'll do, says Starthrow, and for once Stygian felt pity for him. The early days of the Siren War had gone badly. When they'd emerged from the southern Luna Sea and the town there had degenerated into infighting, the High Command had gotten cause and effect backwards. Ponies fought each other and that caused the sirens to invade and eat up all the negative energy being born. They hadn't realized that sirens caused ponies to fight. So they'd gotten it back to front. They sent small squadrons to force bees on the ponies, which just meant that the ponies had a new target on which to take out their anger. And once the soldiers had decided the ponies were more dangerous than the sirens, they would finally heard new voices urging them on. They would listened to the siren's song. Flash Magnus breathed deeply. Stygian had recruited him first, which only meant Flash had seen far more fights than he'd wanted to. Once the sirens target the larger settlement, said Flash, the army won't take any chances with a small task force. They'll go big, he muttered. About time. Exactly, said Starswirl. And the fewer settlements are left, the more desperate they'll become. That means do or die. But why in between, sir? said Stygian. Because, young Colt, if we choose only one of the cities and wait there, the sirens will simply attack the other. Without us defending it, the city will fall. Once the sirens have a city full of hatred fueling them, on top of countless settlements worth of the stuff, even we will be powerless to stop them from mopping up the rest. With all due respect, sir, said Stygian, if we're in between, how can we guarantee we'll reach the attack city in time anyway? They're only a few hours apart. Even Rockhoof could clear that distance at a gallop, when with two Pegasi scouting for us, it'll be easier still. Whereas, if we pick Canterlot and Sirens go for Everfree instead, they'll have enough time to eat up considerable power before we realize their mistake. Somnambula tapped the map. Except the Sirens will not do that. Of course they will. Using his hoof, Stars will trace the spiral. Look at the course they're charting. Yes, Starswell, I see it. But we see what the sirens want us to see. Paw, Peacock, you make them sound too intelligent. Somnambula leaned back. Although her eyelashes flapped like butterflies under the blinking, 
When she finally settled into a frown, the dark wings became knives of shadow. The eyeliner, at least Stygian assumed it was eyeliner, having never seen how or even whether the mare used cosmetics at all, gave her a glower that cut further than her face, carving up the air for sheer fury. My tribe tells many legends of the sirens, she said, low and menacing as a crouched panther, beyond the desert of Nap, along the coast. The monsters are said to seize unwary travelers. Beware, beware, my little mare, for siren's song is beyond compare. My mother taught me how they reach into your mind, looking for any scrap of anger, any morsel of fear, any flicker of resentment. Around the table, silence held its counsel. Only the sounds of someone torturing a fiddle broke through, yet it sounded far away. Creatures like that know ponies, Somnambula continued. They know how we feel, how we think. They have to. They are ugly beasts no one would trust, so they sneak around us. They listen to our complaints and grievances. They avoid the soldiers where they can. If they know they are being followed, they fly away and hide or lure them into traps. On the seas or on the sands, there are monsters all around us. Somnambula, whispered Miss Payne gently, you don't have to. We know how to deal with ordinary monsters, but those three sirens are getting smarter and smarter. How? I know. I am familiar with the free in question, said Starswirl. It must be their leader. She is something else. She's different. She's smarter and stronger, and she's far more ambitious than any creature I've ever encountered. Somnambula does have a point, sir, said Flash Magnus. If they were ordinary monsters, they couldn't possibly have gotten this far. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. No perhaps about it, sir. Remember Snake Island, sir? For once, Starswell shuddered. I remember Stake Island very well, thank you. Exactly. A whole island full of Pegasus warriors, sir, all seasoned veterans. Fortified garrison, warned ahead of time. Unicorn shield spells, earth ponies monitoring the caves, going in and out of the camp, and regular checks on anyone trying to get in. All kept hush-hush and hidden ready for ambush. I said I remember very well. Stygian didn't. He'd been south at the time, looking for Somnambula, but he'd remembered Flash coming back, armor dented, out of breath, and flying as though he wanted to drop out of the sky. The Sirens knew magic. Magic they shouldn't have known if they were just ordinary monsters. The Sirens hadn't bought it with a direct attack. They cursed one ordinary earth mare and sent her to slit through the defenses as a refugee. Then, like a virus, the curse had spread. Once it reached the soldiers, who were jumpy and itching for a fight in any case, the unicorns barely had a chance. The shield went down, and immediately the sirens had leaped in. Like they'd been waiting for it, Flash had said. Star Squirrel ran a hoof over his face. He'd been part of the S.H.I.E.L.D. squad at the time, under royal orders. As far as he was concerned, it had been his S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, he looked very old indeed, or very ill. It is entirely possible, said Flash Magnus carefully, going over a script in his head, that, uh, that the Earth Mare at that time just happened to have been infected with the curse? She was a refugee, after all. I do not think so, Captain Magnus. Somnambula pointed at another part of the map, closing to the frozen north, where Equestria howled under blizzards. They knew we knew their trick by then. They completely missed the ambush at Saskatchewan. Proof that the Earth Mare infectee was a fluke. No. They knew that we had learned that trick by then. I believe... I know they had learned to work around any ambushes by that point. They only targeted small villages for the following three weeks. Flash Magnus nodded. All right. 
See, they were trying to be careful, building up strength, but that way they wouldn't need tactics like cursing one refugee. They could just force their way in. Yes, but even so, began Miss Main, they learn, insisted Somnambula. That must be why we always lose. We underestimate their cunning. Starswell snorted. Yes, the rest of us are aware of that. Thank you, Somnambula. Oh boy, weren't they just. Stygian had first seen their magical battles up close around about the time that Mage Meadowbrook came out of her swamp to join them. Stygian himself managed to trap one of the sirens with a bubble spell. Nothing a stubborn enemy couldn't break eventually, but enough to hold her in place for a comrade to aim a blow. Somnambula and Flash Magnus had prepared to strike, only to be tackled by the other two, who had sent the startled Pegasi flying right into Stygian. He hadn't remembered much, except a sickening crack. If it hadn't been for Mage Meadowbrook, he dreaded to think what his back would have looked like, how much worse it could have felt, whether he might even have lived to see it again in a mirror. But then she'd slug him onto her shoulders in a lift that was all about business, and not at all about preserving his dignity, and while he'd been carried off to recover, he swore the same siren he'd trapped had glowed about her chest. The bubble spell collapsed around it. Of course, he thought, sirens have magical gemstones embedded in their chests. He remembered now from one of his old bestiaries. That was when the siren had conjured her own bubble, holding Rockhoof at bay long enough for the sirens to escape. Those gemstones didn't just absorb negative energy, they absorbed magic. The sirens learned spells by consuming them. And how many times had Star Swirl hurled his best of them, only to have it hurled back? It was like fighting yourself. My point is, said Somnambula, thumping the map for emphasis, if the Sirens want us to think they are spiraling into the center of Equestria, then they want us to waste time in the cities. And I repeat, those are prime feeding grounds, Star Swirl's horn flashed. Magical lines encircled the two cities right in the middle of the map. Where else are they going to go? It's a puzzle, sir, said Stygian, trying to sound as loyal as his reedy voice allowed. Hoofsteps thumped towards them. Is this a private party? growled Rockhoof. Or can any pony join? Part 3 I'm joining either way, growled Rockhoof when no one answered him. The others stared past him. Both Pegasi stifled giggles behind their hooves. Even Star Swirl went red under his beard and long locks of mane. Where's Meadowbrook? said Miss Main. Rockhoof nodded over to the bar where the fiddler finally found a tune. Clapping and heavy steps broke out. Making a spectacle of herself, he muttered. What a fine dancer she is, was all Star Swirl could say with a straight face. Stygian watched the hem of that dress flounce, and goodness did it flounce. He thought he'd seen the limit of what a dress could do with a hoedown to the hayseed swamp shacks. But Meadowbrook danced as though every limb had its own beat, and all of them were trying to outdo the others. Her beehive bobbed so much, some of the stallions unwise enough to join her were coming away with hooves covering their noses. Ever aware, Stygian glanced in mistmane. The mare's lips were thin and tight. So, said Flash, overflowing with nonchalance, I suppose your friend and you settle your differences, Rocky? None can say I begrudge a young lass her right to enjoy herself, said Rocka coldly. Indeed, and a right to enjoy several other stallions, by the look of it. I would have beaten that iron blowhard in another minute. She got no right breaking up a perfectly healthy mudslinging. Flash Magnus placed his helmet on his seat, eyes wide and cheeks cracking. Yes, shameful. I don't suppose that fiddler takes requests. Away where we are then, if you must make fools of us. Sir, yes sir. Grinning, Flash threw off a salute and threw himself into the flouncing fray. 
Soon, laughter from him and her shook the floorboards again. For a while, the others simply looked up or craned on their stools to watch the flail of limbs. When it came to dancing, Flash was every inch the rival of someone like Meadowbrook. Don't be so dour, Rockhoof. Miss Mayne reached across and patted him on the foreland kindly. I think it's splendid to see ponies live in the moment. There's a beautiful dignity in young joy. We're warring, Miss Mayne. Our friends all over need us to be strong. They'd also want us to be happy and to enjoy our time while we can. Where will they be tomorrow? Who knows? But today, we thrive in the here and now. Anyway, said Somnambula calmly, we have seen you in the meat halls. That's different, Rockoff said, but his voice had lost the argument. Somnambula giggled. Singing loudly, dancing and drinking, playing bad music, enjoying nights in between days of fighting, and yet you say they are totally different. What a riddle you tell, indeed. I said, that's different. Stygian rustled the edge of the map, the better to indicate that anything not involving the map could wait. I think it would be best to exercise caution, yes. Meadowbrook's running low on healing herbs, unless this town has an apothecary? Sadly, Miss Main shook her head. Then we can't afford any more injuries, he finished. All right said Starthrill witheringly, and opposite him, Somnambula's eye flashed a warning. Then tell us, my dear, what you would have us do next, since the cities are supposed to be a fate. The others watched as the Pegasus folded up her forelimbs and glanced up, down, this way, that way, almost any way, but at the narrowed eyes of Starthrill. This was her brain on full power. They knew better than to interrupt its keen workings. Stygian felt something nudge his elbow. When he checked, a saddleback that hadn't been there before now floated between him and Miss Mane. Suspicion prodded him into glancing from it to her horn. Both glowed brightly. Only a trained unicorn could see the magic, but Starstroll was too busy withering Somnambula to notice. She cut out both glows. Puzzled, Stygian rummaged around inside the saddleback. He tried not to make too much rustling. Quite apart from interrupting Somnambula's thought process, he didn't want to interrupt their current lack of interest in him either. Perhaps he could surprise them with his insights. Silence, Somnambula murmured. We know their power comes from other ponies, but it starts with their song. Does it? trilled Starthrill. An inspired observation. Do go on. Miss Mane shot him a warning look. Suddenly, his withering look itself withered. Songs, 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 murmured Somnambula under her breath. There's another kind of enchantment, said Rockoff. He nodded sagely. Earth born is ken about the power of song. Legend still of all in nature, whose beautiful voice could summon the birdies and the beasties to do her bidding. She helped turn off the crystal pony army just by calling the bears to tear them apart and the crows to go for their eyes. Sounds familiar? Miss Main's brow creased. Ah, yes, that does sound familiar. My parents told stories about a singing pony like that too. Hmm? said Somnambula. Ghost song, the sensitive. The ancient songwriter, said Stygian. He'd read a few of Miss Main's scrolls on her travels. From master to student, she granted him a nod. Ghost songs wrote many of the world's most beautiful poems. They said she could do more. She could sing so beautifully that anyone who heard her would fall to their knees crying because she showed them that life was as precious and fragile as the petals of the cherry blossom. Emperors and warlords surrendered if they knew she was coming. She was a great force for peace in the ancient world. All right. Sighed Starstwirl in his best, I'm putting up with this voice. Supposing this is true, what do these legends have to do with the sirens? Over at the bar, Meadowbrook and Flash Magnus tackled between them a river dance that definitely had some raging rapids in it. The other patrons clapped along heartily. Laughter made several shameless bids for freedom. 
Tijin took the opportunity to stop rummaging. He'd found what he wanted. And when were these, sir? he said. Even addressing the group, he kept talking as though Starstwirl were alone. The clues we found along the way. The clues? repeated Starstwirl. Oh, well, young Colt. Stygian laid them down carefully on the table. All heads not currently engaged in river dancing came closer. Rock of stool creaked under the shifting weight. Pieces from the hop of Crook's Metahorn, said Stygian. The gilded chunks of cedar wood rattled on the table. Skin from the drum of Warmonger, he briefly held up the tatters. And, he began, snapped off reeds from the bagpipes of Sleeping Hill, the giant. Rockhoof's jaw tightened. Defiled. On his behalf, Miss Main's eyes gleamed with unshed tears. It wasn't your fault, Rockhoof. None of us knew. You did everything you could, even when all the ponies were fighting all around you. The others waited for him to grind his teeth. That had been a bad day. The sirens had attacked another town, but this time the seven heroes had ambushed them. Ah, those sirens. They'd been too quick. The party had split up. Rockhoof and Meadowbrook chased one siren, Flash Magnus and Somnambula chased another. If only Stygian had seen the ploy for what it was. But he hadn't, and the sirens had led the group on a freeway chase all over the town and had given them the slip. Stygian himself had chased after the leader, along with Starswirl and Mismane. And the three unicorns had reached a bridge and had galloped right into the rising ambush of sea serpents. How sirens had recruited sea serpents, no one had figured out. What kind of bargain, after all, could make several hundred feet of scaly rage swim upstream? Right into fresh water and patiently wait for free unicorns to cross a bridge at the precise moment those unicorns couldn't afford a vicious distraction? Miss Main thought it might have been coincidence. The poor serpents must have strayed from home and gotten scared and panicky. Starswell insisted they'd been cursed slaves, but Stygia doubted it. After a Snake Island fiasco, Starswell had taught him the tricks. So by then, Stygian could tell whether or not someone was cursed by looking for a tiny green light deep in their eyes. For an eye bigger than its head, such a glow would have been obvious, though it hadn't made his nightmares thereafter any nicer. Only when the sirens had escaped and the seven heroes had regrouped did they find the castle archives ransacked. Rocco fled to the vaults and they followed and found... Here and now... Stygian stared at the broken reeds. Priceless heirlooms reduced to pieces. A hoof tapped the pieces one by one. Somnambula withdrew it. Why? she asked. Not this again, growled Rockhoof. We can why they've done it. Those vandals will ruin whatever they cannot control. Music, free and wild as the north wind. We're sure we're not weak to music, said Stygian. I'm afraid we've tried that already, said Miss Main. At Clarinet Cove. If they were weak before then, they weren't thereafter. Their magic simply overpowers the sound. They fear it, though, murmured Somnambula. That clarinet music frightened them. Yes, once during hoedown season. After that, I'm afraid it was useless. We should have kept up the barrage. It would have broken through. Tell that to the ponies at the hoedown. They had enough problems rebuilding their poor homes. Stygian wondered when the other attempts had happened. Possibly while he was seeking Rockhoof of the northeast coast of Equestria. Goodness, he lost track so easily. How long had the war been going on now? A few years, at least. So many battles blurred in his memory. Then perhaps those instruments were part of a broader legend? Said Somnambula, still looking for a chink in the armor. Groaning, Miss Main shook her head. None that I'm aware of, and I've studied magical artifacts intensively. As have I, said Starswirl. I tell you, these are not targets. He nodded to the ruined pieces between them. They're merely acts of destruction. 
Perhaps the sirens feared rival music long ago when they were young, but no longer, certainly not now, never went faced with it. Except for... Somnambula began. A fluke. Such a tactic has never really availed us in this war, however we tried it. Not even your sacred silent cobra charmer had any effect on them. Gaze and flappable, Somnambula calmly replied. That is not true. I am sure it would have worked. Starthrol harumphed. Nervously, Stygian glanced across at Stamambula. The Cobra Charmer had been used once, the only time he'd ever seen music deployed against the Sirens, simply because it was a magical item. Alas, he remembered it well. Somnambula had been on fire that day. He shuddered at the mere memory of the charm spell and the way she'd swayed and played it and how elegant she'd suddenly look as though... Just for a moment she'd become a sinuous goddess, and of all the stallions in all the world, he swore she'd whispered into his lowly ear, Yes, yes, yes. Well, um, it, it, had, it had definitely worked on him, all right. He'd needed an hour in a cold bath afterwards. Rockhoof and Star Swirl had been unexpectedly red in the face, too. Flash Magnus alone had received enough military training to resist a charm. A warrior Pegasus learned magic resistance early on in his career, else he wouldn't enjoy a long one. The sirens? For a while, the charm had slowed them down. It stopped them dead. Meadowbrook had prepared the parasitic pollen, ready to weaken the sirens. Mistmane had prepared to gas the graves boosted by her own anti-magic mistmaker. Once drained by both pollen and mist, the sirens would have been finally helpless. If it hadn't been for the ponies. But the ponies of the Smoky Mountains barely liked each other even before the sirens invaded. Both sides threw pumpkins and catapulted stones at one another. Sirens and heroes in the middle of the valley? Pfft, those were minor distractions. The first pumpkin had smashed over Betterbrook's pollen bag, the second over her head. The hail of stones forced Mistmaid to break off and erect a barrier. Worse, when the ponies came down from their two mountains and stampeded into each other, Somnambulous Cobra Charmer was knocked away during the riot and stamped at the shards. After that, the sirens, no longer stunned, fed well, and they fled to the next site. Later, the heroes had still tried two more attempts at musical magic. By then, the sirens glowed with power. They'd easily resisted both attempts. They'd easily overpowered the music using their own siren songs. Another tactic foiled. At the time, Stygian had expected keen disappointment to burst out of Somnambula like harsh whirlwinds of sand. Some cursing of the sky, some drooping of her ears perhaps or at least a flutter of her eyelashes as she blinked the tears away. It never happened. If anything, every night since, she planned more and frowned harder and fought longer and glanced around all the more, searching for clues in her own head. Here and now, Stygian watched her frowning concentration, himself entranced. How had she not sighed like Mistmaid, not slumped like Meadowbrook? Even the other stallions had yelled their rage and drowned their sorrow at the time. But not she. No setback ever knocked Somnambula down. Beside him, Miss Main idly examined one of the snapped-off reeds. Star Swirl swept the rest aside to search the map for landmarks. Rockhoof stood and waited for the next fox to turn up. No one was getting anywhere. Well, now seemed a decent enough time. Stygian's dry throat cried out. Excuse me. He scraped his chair back. I'm buying another orange squash. It won't be long. No one noticed. A flash of anger was cut off deep in Stygian's head. I don't suppose I could acquire beverages for anyone else, sirs, my ladies? Only Miss Main looked at him and she hummed with pity. Oh, I doubt they have sake here. Could you bring me a fine whiskey, please? Right you are, my lady. On a meager spit of happiness, Stygian saluted and hurried off, away from the table. At least Mistmane giggled behind a hoof. He'd long since learned she liked being doted upon by polite young gentle colts. Still, no one else had looked up. 
What exactly would he have to do to get their attention? Copy Meadowbrook? Part 4 Stygian approached the bar. As he did so, he noticed the fiddler had stopped. Flash Magnus held a bugle he'd taken from only goodness knew where and trumpeted with gusto. Surrounded by a circle of laughing admirers, Meadowbrook was not so much cutting a rug as cheerfully savaging it. Those kicks! No wonder she was so popular among the stallions. The bar stallion himself watched her from his post. Once or twice he clapped and hollered something. After what felt like long enough, Stygian cleared his throat. No response from the bar stallion. He said, Excuse me, sorry sir, I wondered if I could... Bugle bursts battered and boxed his ears. All the stallions laughed at something that made Meadowbrook's dress shoot up suddenly. Stygian wrapped the bar. I'd like to buy two drinks, please, he said over the racket. Still no response. He seized his anger and hit the bar hard. Excuse me, I want a drink. The bar stallion shot him a look that made Stygian's anger run and duck for cover. Nearby, two of the stallions stopped laughing. Hoping like Tartarus he could remove the lump in his throat, Stygian coughed into a hoof. Sorry, sir, he said, trying to squeak. I only meant... Without looking away, the bar stallion slowly and deliberately reached under the counter. Not that Stygian was a stranger to beatings. Some of the old masters weren't shy about discipline via planks and canes. But a club designed to fell ponies like Rocka for Ironsmith had not have heard of featured much in his life. He cringed, ready for the first blow, hoping to whoever was watching that he'd have a little mercy. Stygy, sweetheart, cooed Meadowbrook, said Shane Close. You looking for the hair of the dog that bit you? You only gotta ask. And just like that, the slow and deliberate hoof ducked out of sight before the bar stallion threw on a hasty grin. Beg your pardon, ma'am, he mumbled. Didn't know he was at you. Coast cleared, Stygian let out a breath. For once, he thanked Meadowbrook's timing. What a lifesaver. Darling now, she said to the bar stallion. Be gentle with the poor dear. He's the nice, quiet sort. No trouble at all, you hear? Poor thing, you got him shaking like an aspen leaf and fall. Stygian cursed and steadied himself. Mage Meadowbrook, I can assure you I wasn't shaking. Then he considered how this would fare in the face of a mare who checked pony bodies often enough to tell a quiver from a quake, and definitely a shiver from a shake. I am somewhat cold, however, he added defensively. Mage Meadowbrook cast another patience examination look all over him. It wasn't whether or not she'd spot the lie, it was whether or not she'd let it lie. To his relief, her face broke into a beaming smile. My, my, sugar cube, and I reckon you need heating up. The roads and the years haven't been kind on you. Just two drinks for me, please, he said in a rush. One orange squash and one... He turned to the suddenly alert bar stallion. I don't suppose you have any whiskey, um, sir. What's whiskey? said the bar stallion. Ah, didn't think so. Ooh cooed Meadowbrook, and she really did coo. Her soothing voice made turtle dove sound hawkish. I didn't think you were ready for the strong stuff yet, Stygie. Oh, no, it's not for me, you understand. It's for Lady Miss May. Meadowbrook gave him... Was it a pitying look? An indulgent one? Perhaps with overtones of patronizing. It was a look he strangely wanted and hated all at once. Instead, she turned it to the bar stallion. There'll be one chew spit and one hot fire water, banking all candly, she translated. He actually saluted. Right you are, ma'am. And while he's busy as a bumblebee, Meadowbrook continued, sneaking her forelimb around Stygian's own. How about I give you some dancing lessons to put a honeyed smile on your handsome face? You poor thing, you look like a smile do your world good. Whatever was on Stygian's face, it wasn't honey. Sizzling oil, perhaps. Fire water, even. Extra hot. As gently as he could, he tugged his forelimb. No hope now, 
Middlebrook had a grip that cooked all resistance. And not just because she could give Rockhoof a run for his money when it came to dragging heavy things. Earth mares packed a lot of power, especially ones used to carrying sick bodies around by the cartload in times of plague. Oh, I couldn't, he said, twisting up around his own modesty. I don't dance. Never had lessons back home? Well, one or two ballroom classes, but that was just to socialize. Not that it stuck, he thought darkly. Ice breaking was more what I had in mind, Sugar Cube. We might even break a few glasses tonight. She winked at him. It wasn't an exotic wing, the sort of somnambula use if she wanted her someone to melt bubble and ooze their way to a collapse. It was a motherly wink, the sort that told him that he was okay, nothing bad would happen. Mother Hen would watch over her little chick. Beyond her, the other stallions cheered him on. Sejin hesitated. He wasn't used to big stallions cheering him on. And he had spent a lot of time cooped up in libraries or tagging along behind the others, so why wasn't he owed a bit of fun? Just a short swing, honey, she cooed again. Stygian let a weak grin carry on up to his face. Mom, I fear you have the advantage of me. So sweet! Let's cut a rug, hazy swamp style. As he was dragged to what passed for a dance floor, Stitchy heard the cheers rise up and saw Flash Magnus pass his helmet onto Ironsmith, who nodded and took out his hammer. A bugler, a drummer, and a fiddler. Well, none of that made any conventional music, but he'd given up on using the word conventional anywhere near Meadowbrook, unless it came chaperoned with the words hardly ever. Hayseed Swamp was an odd place indeed. Ever done the jitterbug? she whispered. Stitchy remembered. The ponies of the swamp took a lot of inspiration from its native fauna, for instance, even from dancing insect life. No, never. But a scholar like him always learned by observation. I believe I've seen you perform it before. Then swing, copycat! Swing! Looky here and don't you worry. Follow my lead. Got it? Another motherly wink. Follow her lead? Stygian wondered if he could kick that hive without rupturing a tendon. Then Flash Magnus and his band found a tune, and a one, and a two, and a one, two, three. Credit where it was due, Stygian picked things up fast. Although it didn't hurt that the laughter broke out at his first two attempts. Back at school, he'd learned a cold could make friends if he was funny enough. Stamp. 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 The stallion stamped in rhythm to encourage him. He needed all the encouragement he could get. His spins left him stumbling dizzily before he jumped back into the fray, where Meadowbrook threw in a bit of flourish to each sidestep and swinging march. Stygian kept firm and stiff as a puppet, determined to get the gist, if not the jive, of what her body was saying. The first time she offered a hoof for him to grip, he stuck his out for several blank moments before the laughter and her eye signal set him straight. Thank goodness she never tried any of the really advanced moves. A simple partner spiral, a simple circling back and forth, as though they were trying to stamp brackets around each other with all she'd venture before they broke off and locked gazes. Stamp. 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 He swore it had gotten louder and the circle around him had more colors and ponies in it. Despite Meadowbrook's shaking head, he glanced to see... Uh, oh no. Focus on me, Stitchy, Meadowbrook whispered urgently. Just you and me now, okay? He swallowed. I'll try. But he heard Rockhoof's booming last and strangely missed Main's more silent titters. He couldn't resist glancing again to see her ladyship's twinkling eyes or somnambula's knowing, enigmatic smile. Sugar, watch your feet now. Sorry, Miss Meadowbrook. But his tangled legs got a few more laughs. Dark thoughts crossed his mind. Were they laughing with him or at him? Either way, he didn't dare stop. Nearby, Flash Magnus blew harder and then suddenly moved faster and the circle outside became a blur. Ah, now for a tricky bit. It looked like the legs just swung under them, but his muscles tightened fighting for precise control. Phew, he thought this was harder than it looked. You're doing fine, whispered Meadowbrook. Rear up, sugar. Oh, uh, don't worry. I'll go gentle. 
had seen what moves needed them to be upright. Sitchin saw no way out except to keep going forward, yet fear braced him every step of the way. She reared, he reared. They gripped hooves. His legs dreaded the next moment, and then there came the crosswise kicks. Mercy be, but he did not tear a ligament. If anything, he kicked again and felt a limber, flowing freely. His legs kicked and he twirled and she gripped his forelimbs again and he suddenly felt like someone who had not spent half their lives cooped up indoors. Good grief, and all on his own he was doing things with his shoulders that did not get him laughed at. The music ran through him and then it did what he wanted to. Stamp, stamp, stamp. Bellowing cheer from Rockhoof heard clearly over the din. Don't forget to smile, cried out Meadowbrook when with the stamping. Can't jitterbug without no smile. He forced one. Smiling was improper. It couldn't be allowed. No one laughed. He left a safer smile warm his cheeks. The heat from his kicking, swinging, sidestepping, toe-tapping legs rose up through his chest and up into his face. Now that's a smile, said Meadowbrook. He felt oddly proud about that and smiled all the more. It came to him. He barely even noticed the sweat and clingy feel around his coat. They met hooves past each other and gave one final kick. Strike a pose, she whispered. Now. He held it, wobbling a bit. The stamping stopped, so did the helmet drumming, the fiddling, and when Flash Magnus caught on, the bugling. Stitchin didn't even care he was gasping. The half dozen strange stallions, Flash Magnus, Rockhoof, Somnambul, and Mist Mane all broke into a smiling applause. Flash even whistled. For once, Stitchin felt taller than an ivory tower and twice as bright. Meadowbrook gave his forelimb a tap so he knew to stop posing. Following her lead, Stygian took a bow, one for each of the four directions, north, east, south, and west, and the circle around them made generally good-natured noises like, well, hey, and ooh, 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 and nice one. Flash Magnus yelled, College Vergarosas, and Stygian gave a weak titter in reply. Not half bad for someone born outside Hayseed Swamp, Meadowbrook said. How do you feel now? A lifetime of good manners and scholarly reserve seeped back into Stygian's mind. Whatever wild bronco ride he'd gotten onto had been broken in. Yes, very good, his mind said, an amusing diversion. It was, he began, great, fantastic, amazing, unusual, he settled for and hated himself for his lameness. This didn't seem to face Middlebrook at all. Her hoof nuzzled his cheek, the equine equivalent of pinching it like an auntie. Oh, thank you, such a sweet gentle cold, she said. You should put that in your healing journal, he, sa he said, hoping to earn some brownie points properly. Jitterbug may well be a cure for something. Makes you feel good, don't it? Most definitely. One by one, the ponies around them recognized the show was over. At least when the half-dozen local stallions returned to their stools, they talked amongst themselves like lads on a proper bar crawl and not, for instance, like veterans trying to drink the world away. Watching them, Stygian wondered if Meadowbrook knew about the healing power of dance and music already and had simply indulged him for now. Here's your drink, sir and ma'am, the bar stallion produced one glass and one thimble. Oh, right, said Stygian, who'd clean forgotten. And that'll be, uh, on the house. While well, Stygian levitated two drinks and tried not to spill a drop, Meadowbrook passed a smile to the bar stallion that cast shadows of jealousy in Stygian's own heart. Just not for long. The jitterbug had weakened its venom. Only Star Swirl had remained in his seat, watching the returning party under a cloud of stormy disapproval. You ponies do realize, he said curtly, that Equestria is at war. All the more reason to keep up Morosa, said Flash Magnus. The other sat down around the table, but he hovered first until Somnambula, Mist Mane, and Meadowbrook had taken theirs. Next to Stygian, Mist Mane sipped her firewater and whispered a polite, Thank you. He nodded graciously. Star Swirl gestured to the map full of crossed-out towns in sight. Now, if we can proceed. 
Bonny work, Stygie, said Rockhoof, reaching across and slapping Stygie's back so hard he almost headbutted the table. Didn't I think a pencil pusher like you'd have it in ya? Yes, you are a delight to see, said Somnambula. Oh, well, said Stygian, resisting all efforts to squirm again. I really should be thanking Meadow. A thunderclap made all parties seize their ears, yelling. Stygian winced and groaned under his own, which were two points of agony. Dust settled from the overhead rafters. Only Mistmane looked unfazed, and she glared across at Starswirl, who shut off his spell at once. Now that I've got your attention, Starswirl snapped, perhaps we can turn our minds to the fate of the entire nation. Something that does not involve any of those darn litterbugs. Part 5 The others relaxed. Stygian still nursed his own ears. The echoes of the thunderclap rang over and over in his poor, abused cranium. Really, Star Swirl, said Mistmane, her voice boiling. There was no call for that. Spluttering like a maniac with serious rabies, Star Swirl shook his head in disbelief. No call for... No call for that! Look at you all, shindigging the night away like a bunch of giggly school fillies. Do you realize how many ponies' lives are on the line if we fail? A little song and dance will not be an adequate excuse come the end of the world. Ah, now Stygian knew why he hated Starswell so much. The air of quiet resentment among the other ponies, the way the sorcerer spoke as though he alone knew the answers to the questions, the silence he created around himself just so he could fill it. Star Swirl was from the same class of unicorn that Stygian's tutors had graduated from, and of all the things that class had learned, what they failed to learn most of all was that a pony could not study for every waking hour. He'd seen it in a group around him, after every town lost to the sirens. Meadowbrook, Mistmane, Somnambula, Flash Magnus, Rockhoof. They kept their spirits up, they joked around, they had drinks with each other and laughed over them because of this stupid war. They unwound. If they didn't, they wouldn't be ponies. They'd just be a bunch of killing machines and it'd be worse because there would be killing machines that kept failing to kill the enemy. But he said nothing. One thing Stygian learned was that answering back made you a target. Unlike the others, he had no weapon to throw back, not even strong words. So, he said nothing. Starswell adjusted his hat, jangling those stupid bills of his. Why did he even wear the things? So everyone knew when he was around? We can well what we're up against, rumbled Rockhoof. You know me, Meadowbrook shrugged. I like to get to know a place before I settle in, and raising spirits is all part of the healing, Mr. Swirl. Songs and dances, said Star Swirl, are not going to save Equestria. Now, if we've gotten it out of our system, it's time to discuss the matter of how we intend to dispatch the siren fret. Oh, come on, thought Stygian in the safety of his own head. Songs and dances are powerful enough in the right hooves. The sirens themselves prove it. Listen to their siren songs, watch the way they move, feel their music creeping up on you, and tell me songs and dances are just... silly... a little... wait. That was it, wasn't it? Songs and dances in Equestria were special. Hadn't he learned that years ago? Songs and dances weren't just funny things ponies did for giggles. They were important. They were alive. They appeared like spirits at just the right time and place. They possessed hosts in the right frame of mind. That was how the siren song worked. The sirens exploited living songs and their power. While the others talked, or Star World talked, and the others occasionally butted in, Stygian ferreted through the saddlebag beside him and pulled out a quill and paper. After a distracted rush of writing, he sheepishly pulled out the inkwell, too. It had helped. Now, songs were living things. Sirens used them to manipulate ponies into getting angry. 
sense AP anger and other kinds of negative energy. So what did the songs get out of it? If they were living things, then what would they need? Star swirl, droned on and on. Something about remaining outposts. Meanwhile, Stygian's thoughts rushed to him. Ponies like Meadowbrook presumably controlled songs too, calling them forth when needed. Yes, good, and how did they do that? Ponies. Ponies had to set the stage and the songs would come and roost. But the sirens forced the songs, make them take over the stage, change them. It was like a bird den taking over another bird's nest by fighting for it? Rockhoof rumbled a protest only for Flash Magnus to throw his in two, punctuated by Sa here and there. Sirens forced the songs to ruse. Songs create negative energy, energy eaten by sirens. What if they shared it? A kind of payment for the songs to cooperate. That was how many living things cooperated in nature, like the fungi and the little plants and lichens. Hadn't he studied such habits as part of his natural philosophy scholarship? Where did the energy go? Quill shaking, he jotted down one word. Gemstone. Every siren had one in its chest. Was that where the songs lived too? Eating their share of energy and then readying themselves for the next victim? Gemstone traditionally held all sorts of magical things. Some scholars believe gems, crystals, and so on were, in fact, the ultimate source of all magic. Even quite small gemstones would provide it. So that meant they were a weakness. Gemstones were targets. He hesitated. Supposing a song wasn't powerful enough, though. Not on its own. Songs had been known to take over whole towns, but the effects wouldn't last long. They couldn't. Songs needed the right moment, the right emotion, and emotions changed on a dime. Certainly not long enough for even free sirens to control pony minds, much less control them with such perfection that they threatened Equestria. Something else had to be involved. Something that brought ponies like him alive when he danced. Opposite him, Flash Magnus stopped while Somnambula made an insistent speech. They'd need help. Reinforcements, perhaps. He picked up the saddlebag again while Star Squirrel launched into a lecture. After all, the songs and magic hid inside the gemstones, so what did you use to break them open, to let the songs and magic escape? Music? Hence broken pieces of instrument. He looked inside the saddlebag once more. In fairness, the sirens probably just didn't want competition from powerful enough musicians. Musicians tamed songs and dances as well as music. Declaring that Cove's stunt proved those sirens had some weakness to music, right up until they had become immune. Yet despite apparently being immune, They'd still gone after legendary instruments. The harp of Crocs Matterhorn, the drum of Warmonger, the bagpipes of Sleeping Hill the Giant. So they had progressed up the ladder from weaker instruments to stronger ones? If you played the bagpipes, a giant would be your friend. If you played anything the right way, a miracle would happen. It had happened in this bar with nothing but a bugle and a helmet. And a bad fiddler. Yet that had to be magic. Maybe not one he understood, but magic nonetheless. Meadowbrook made it feel like magic. Magic based on music, music based on emotions. What power could be there? Could they use it? Next to him, Miss Main sipped her firewater, easily heard even over Meadowbrook's complaints and Star's full retorts. Songs roosted in ponies because they were the ones who sang. Where did the music live? In instruments? Songs were spirits. Music could be too. So if sirens could force the spirits of songs to work for them, that's where they're getting their power from, he muttered aloud. I'm sorry, said Mistmain, lowering her drink. 
cursing himself, but unable to refuse, Tijin said, The sirens, my lady. That's why they attack musical instruments. They're not just destroying our best weapons, they're, they're eating the music inside them. Well now, said out loud, that didn't sound dumb at all. He groaned and hid himself. As a source of power, said Miss Maine. Stygian gaped at her. Not a note of condescension or doubt in that voice. Yes, he said, so loud with relief that the others stopped to look at him. As a source of power, exactly. The sirens can't keep relying on the same songs over and over, not to control a town or even a city. They need allies. Songs get stronger in the presence of music and... and, um... The other stares wore him down to doubtfulness. He stopped talking. Starstwirl raised an eyebrow at him. Is there something the matter, Stygian? Stygian lowered his gaze to the map. Partly this was because it was better than being the center of attention, but partly it was because the spiral that Starstwirl had drawn also drew his eye to the two cities right in the middle. There would be a ton of musical instruments in Canterlot or Everfree, no doubt about it. They'd be heavily guarded, though, spells stronger than any he'd encountered elsewhere. The sirens would have to be good to break through. Were they good enough yet? But then, why had they targeted this little village? It was a little way out of the center. The army had yet to arrive in full numbers, so why not grab the cities now before the defense tightened? Starswell might have thought it was an anomaly, but what if it wasn't? What if Somnambula was right, and she usually was when it came to trickery and cunning? Um, he said, totally lost. If you break a musical instrument, said Miss Mayne, and she levitated the broken reeds and drum skinned for all to see, where does the music go? 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 It doesn't go anywhere, said Flash Magnus, puzzled. Music's something you make. It's not like it flaps through the air looking for... To Stygian's amazement, Starstroll held up a hoof at this. Actually, there might be a point here, Captain Magnus. Sa? Songs, as you say, flap through the air. There's a well-known theory in magical circles. Oh, true, some ponies make better hoes than others, but the songs are there... Well, you know, your muses of old. Flash Magnus chuckled, but nervously, as no one else joined in. Yes, sir, but those are old bear's tales. No one really believes in muses. I fail to see why that is a problem, said Starswell with irritating reasonableness. It's plausible, I suppose, that music operates in the same way. It exists, as it were, in potentia. Never heard of the place, said Meadowbrook. He means, said Flash Magnus, now resorting to a puzzled grin, that it exists somewhere just because it can exist. It just doesn't exist here yet. Oh, this ain't that other world stock again, is it? She said suspiciously. Mist Mane finally cut in with a determined glare. The siren songs are getting stronger, she said before Flash Magnus opened his mouth. And they attacked legendary musical instruments, whilst at the same time becoming immune to musical attacks. Shouldn't we at least take this seriously? Take what seriously? said Somnambula. But the sirens aren't just controlling songs. They're learning how to control music, too. Powerful music. How powerful? Powerful as the harp of Crook's Matterhorn? Powerful as the drum of Warmonger, powerful as the bagpipes of... All right, all right, muttered Rockhoff. Don't remind me. But so what? said Flash Magnus. Even if the sirens are, what, eating the music out of Rockhoff's bagpipes or something? What's the point? They're dining like kings on negative energy. Power limits, said Starswell at once. Of course. One siren, controlling a repertoire of songs, can do some damage, but we have easily contained it by now. Three sirens? Difficult, but manageable. Now imagine hundreds of sirens. Flash Magnus broke his forehead under the sweaty stress of thinking. 
But we're not fighting. Not literally. If what Miss Main says is true, and the music is joining the ranks too, then we might as well be. Each siren has to her repertoire. That's why they progress from villages to towns to cities. They progress from a few songs to a hundreds of songs and grow stronger as they do so. And therefore, free sirens can bring a questioner to its knees as easily as an army of hundreds. If what Miss Bain says is true, Stygian reeled from the words. But he had the notes right here. He raised a hoof to object. Um, was as far as he got. There is good news, sir. Let's pretend that's true, said Flash Magnus, giving Miss Main an apologetic look. So what? It doesn't help us predict where they'll strike next. We're right back at square one. Not quite, said Starthrill. Think, Captain Magnus. The sirens are progressing. What we'll want next is the most magical musical instrument possible. Something that would give them the necessary boost to attack a city, what? True, sir. Only it isn't going to be in any one city in that case, said Stygian, wishing like heck he could make up his mind whether to complain or go along with it. The army will still be expecting them, and maybe it's too much of a gamble for the sirens picking 50-50 and then finding we're waiting for them at the one they pick. I still do not trust this map, Somnambula pointed at the spiral. This little town around us is outside the spiral. They must be heading for another destination. Before attacking the capital cities, said Flash Magnus, rubbing his chin. Yes, I suppose if I was an army going to invade those, I'd want as many reinforcements as I could find. Only where would I go to find it? Anywhere here? Rocco ran a giant hoof over the middle of the map, sweeping a broad area surrounding the cities. Perhaps, said Miss May, nodding to Somnambula. Perhaps it is a feint. Our current position is... She levitated Sijin's inkwell and placed it firmly in a spot. Here. Southwest, muttered Starthrow. That's towards ghastly caverns. Nothing there but empty wilderness and desert beyond that. Not a major settlement in sight. Rockhoof leaned over the map, accidentally squeezing Somnambula against the table until she thumped him and he backed off sheepishly. Sorry, mm, it looks bad for the magic music theory, Beardy. But Sitchin glared at the map. Perhaps it was a faint indeed, just not the one they were thinking of. He hurried over to the bar stallion. Excuse me, sir, but could you tell me which way the sirens were last seen? The bar stallion gave him an odd look. Sirens? Sort of flying fish ponies, three of them. They sing beautifully. Them three you got already ain't good enough, said Ironsmith nearby. This was greeted with mild chuckles from the other patrons, but then this did pass for traditional tavern humor. Patiently, Stygian waited until one of them gave him a straight answer. If any heard hoofsteps come up behind him and saw the other stallion straighten up, he didn't even need to turn to see the sweeping skirt and know it was Meadowbrook. I don't suppose you'll recollect whether you did cast your eye on any critters of that neck of the woods, she said. Further along the bar, one stallion raised a hoof sheepishly. I recollect something of that ilk, ma'am. Heading northwest, ma'am. Sijin seethed where he stood. Why did Meadowbrook act like he needed a minder? If those fools had just answered him instead of making stupid jokes. Over his head, Meadowbrook said, you got any more of that there brandy, sugar cube? They both sat back down without a word, Meadowbrook's brandy sloshing in a tankard. An argument broke out. Unusually, Star Swirl wasn't involved. I told you there's nothing there, insisted Flash Magnus, almost standing up. He was so upright with indignation. Look, the sirens are strong. I will accept that upon my honor as a warrior. But they are not tactical geniuses. And Somnambula just told you, young stallion, said Miss Main coolly, that we've underestimated them before and suffered for it. I believe she is right to be suspicious. This time, we need to think before we charge into battle. Are you suggesting this young stallion can't think? I'm suggesting you don't think enough. We're not after settlements. We're after famous, legendary, or powerful musical instruments. We've swept that territory already. 
if there were anything of note in the southwest of Equestria, when we've already passed it. And there isn't, chipped in Starthworld before Flash Magnus had drawn breath, which means the sirens want to confuse us. Huh, muttered Flash Magnus. For doing a bang up job then, sir. Stygian glared at the map. He had to admit Starthworld had a point. If veering off their spiral course was meant to be a feint, it was a pathetically obvious one. Anyone could see that. The sirens had been furrowed down there. The southwest certainly had no musical marvels. So the feint was itself a feint? And if you needed to keep your enemies away, then you drew them as far away from your real target as possible. Meadowbrook stopped gulping her drink. One of the nice gentlecoats said those sirens were heading northwest. Yes, thought Stygian, and that didn't make sense either. The only major settlements up there were the ones in the Smoky Mountains, and the ponies there sure weren't musical marvels. A faint of a faint of a faint, then? His gaze fell over the map. If the sirens had itself and then turned and went north, that was only to get halfway to their real target, but that it wouldn't go straight to said real target. None of them knew they were being followed, and they were on a time limit. Stygia and his friends, he supposed, were getting closer every time. So, the sirens went south, tried to fool us into thinking they went north, so either east or west? But there was nothing to the west. As he checked the east side of the map, his eye spotted a gap. Yes, the spiral wasn't perfect. Mountains, lakes, inconvenient garrisons. The sirens sometimes had to work around them all. Stygian knew his maps, though. He checked multiple gaps just to make sure. Now, that one was a mountain. That one was where the frozen north forced the sirens back. And that one was an empty desert. Inevitably, his eyes fell upon the gap he'd known and dreaded would be there. Hollow shades, he murmured. Part 6 Hollow shades, Stygian repeated. No one noticed that time either, not even Miss Bain. Grunting, he moved right up to the edge of the table and stretched a hoof over to the spot. Hollow shades, he said again, louder. Oh? Your hometown? said Somnambula, and Stygian for once thanked someone for fretting on his behalf. His hometown, yes. He hadn't said it, someone else had. Mouth too tight to talk, he nodded, slowed by the weight of realization. What makes you so sure? said Starthrow. There's a famous musical instrument there, sir, Stygian blurted out. One of the most famous of all. It goes back for thousands of years, sir. Needs a tune up then, rumbled Rockhoof. Flash Magnus joined in when he guffawed. No, sir, insisted Stygian in his tired voice. If it's magical you want, then magical you'll get. Mist made some of the inkstand and other writing tools to drop them into the saddlebag, which flashed out of existence. What do you mean, Stygian? The organ of light, he said. He ignored the new wave of guffaws from the two stallions. The organ of light was above such pettiness. That story. Stygian had learned this one early, locked away in his Tower of Learning. Occasionally, he'd left the tower long enough to blink out the sunlight, and then one day, his evening walk had taken him a little way out of town, to an old well and down the hidden tunnel. Only the most esteemed unicorns were allowed inside to see the Well of Shadows. Closing his eyes, he saw the endless rows of columns, the cavernous space where darkness itself pooled and flooded. The equestrians found it as a ruin left over by whomever had lived in hollow shades long ago. No one ever had a good dream near the well, though, so the town had been built some way away from it, leaving it as an eye in the middle of a circle of cottages. Even being there, Stygian had quailed at the carvings on the wall and heard whispers trying to reach him from thousands of years ago. Everyone in Hollow Shades believed it was built to keep darkness contained. Not destroy it, darkness couldn't be destroyed, but it could be safely put away where it could do no harm, and no pony was dumb enough to mess with it. No pony could go in unless they were trusted. 
What frightened Stygian most, however, was the gigantic organ kept inside. At first, it made no sense. The Wall of Shadows was a cistern meant for darkness to seep in and pool. Why would an organ be kept inside one? After many studies, though, and after examining its glowing pipes and its oral radiance and the mysterious carvings on the wall, Stygian went back to his tower and wrote a long treatise on the nature of darkness and light. The organ of light guarded the place. Darkness and shadows, they sent nightmares up to the surface. They'd send much worse misery, he concluded, if it wasn't for the organ. Whether it was played or not, its sacred music overpowered the shadows, kept hearts glad, reminded ponies of good dreams and happy memories and art and love and the majesty of this world. It should never be removed or destroyed or drained of its power. To do so would be to unleash chaos. If the sirens broke the organ of light, he breathed, and his imagination smashed a rest over his head, and he fell silent. Starswell nodded, pulling his own beard as though to rip it off slowly and painfully. The organ of light is one of a kind. I heard the citizens of Everfree built a replica for their own castle, but it didn't work. Who knows what kind of power it contains? After gulping her brandy, Meadowbrook hummed, worry creasing along her face. What kind of power does it pack? Enough to control shadows and darkness, quavered Miss May. Some say the organ of light holds back all the powers of Tartarus itself. Yes, said Starswirl, letting his beard go. Canterlot and Everfree would stand no chance. In the silence, the light outside dimmed. Stool shuffled back and the door squeaked and slammed. When Stygian checked, the bar was empty save for Ironsmith, who noticed him staring and slipped out. The bar stallion got out and turned chairs upside down, the clear but unspoken request for certain ponies to start making their way home, if they had any. He shuddered. We're sure, said Flash Magnus. I don't want to go to this hollow shades place and find no one there. Where else can they go, Captain Magnus, said Starthrow. They might be strong, but the sirens still need to stop and feed as they travel. So long as we eat on the hoof, we might be able to beat them in time. In addition, they remain vulnerable to magical attacks. It's merely luck and speed and second-guessing that's kept us from taking them down. Now that the army's converging on the capital cities... No, it makes sense now. The siren leader, she's an adaptable one. She's always had a fascination with music. Sir? said Stygian. The sorcerer had a faraway look, and he himself knew that it could see for centuries. At least he's listening to my ideas now, he thought Stygian, however long it took to get the old wind back there. Now for the coup de grace. But there is good news, sir, he said again, having waited so long already. I believe the sirens are not the only ones who can use the organ of light. We could harness its power, too. If we stick together and use their own magic against them, if we could stand strong and united as one force, like we did for the jitterbug, sir, I believe we could feel its power. We could overpower the sirens long enough to smash their chinstone and destroy their power source. No one was listening. They were all staring at the sorcerer. Stygian was too shocked to move. This was supposed to be his moment. He'd done what Somnambula would have done and fought things through. He'd used his learning like Mistmain and planned tactics like Flash and valued their strength like Frockhoof. He'd even been inspired by Meadowbrook. It was the perfect moment. He knew it was. The moment died, as did his outrage, as did his courage. A flash later, the map vanished from the table. Starswell rose from his chair like a rocket. I say we go to the Well of Shadows, he boomed. At daybreak. Perhaps the sirens will attack the cities, but it's possible we could double back and join the army soon enough to turn the tide. It would be risky, I will not lie, but an army is something that'll slow down the sirens, especially now that regiments have learned their tricks. Stygian watched as his perfect moment got commandeered by someone else. He didn't even feel angry. 
Anger was too small for this. But, prompted Miss Main gently, Starswell rolled his eyes as though an idiot had heckled him. But, if they're heading for this organ of light, then that changes things. They'd be free to set dry one of the most powerful artifacts imaginable. After that, no force in Equestria could oppose them. It's still a gamble, sir, said Flash Magnus, who exchanged a worried glance for Somnambula. And even if we did go there, she added, what would we do? Magical attacks have only achieved so much. Star Swirl glared at the table. Stygian saw the struggle behind that glare, breaking through the surface as the muscles twitched and winced. Desperation worried that mouth, and anger fought their way through the eyes, and cold steel cut all expression out. The cold steel won. It's time, Starswell said, and there was no feeling in his voice, no trace of the pony, and every trace of the sorcerer. Nothing in this world can outmatch them, so why keep them here? Mistmane rose off her stool so fast it clattered and hit Stygian and the hawks. No, she snapped. This time, Starswell did not back down. Why not? The spell would rid Equestria of these monsters forever. They'd be locked away in a cursed place where no one would suffer on their account ever again. The spell has never been tried. The theory, my theory, Miss Main, is sound. It would tear through nature's borders like a sword through flesh. Think of the damage it would do to open up a wound like that. What damage? spat Sarswell. The damage that sends ponies mad with fear and hatred? The damage that flattens towns with writhing? That damage? Meadowbrook shuddered. Mist means barking up the right tree, Star Swirl. It's unnatural. Even Stygian leaned back to avoid the blade of that glare. Star Swirl rounded on Meadowbrook as though he'd drawn a sword on her. Everything we do is unnatural, he roared. Look around you. If it wasn't for Stygian, would a motley circus like you five have had anything to do with each other? All right, all right, but all the same. Meadowbrook waved a hoof to calm him down. Magic crafters have always tempered with nature simply to learn more natural philosophy. A national emergency surpasses that motive in terms of urgency. How many ponies have you saved with knowledge that was once condemned as unnatural? Somnambula stood up to match him, as did Flash Magnus. We know, she said, how dangerous it is to tamper with otherworldly affairs. Every one of us has heard stories about those heroes or villains who crossed to the other world so foolishly. It could upset the balance of our world, bringing chaos in its wake. I think we should use a tried and tested method, sir, agreed Flash Magnus. As my old sergeant used to say, better the kick you know than the cannon you don't. Stygian kept his mouth shut. When Starswell glared at him for support, he looked down at his hooves. Stygian didn't trust himself not to glare back. They were breaking apart. All of them needed him to keep them together. They would have lost this war without him already. If they'd only shown the spirit he felt when he danced just then, the love and camaraderie and the joy of their stamping and smiling. Why? He knew he was right. If only they had listened to him. Rakoff, snapped Starthrow. What say you for this? Nearby, Vart Stallion found more stools on tables. How could he ignore such an obvious argument breaking out in his own tavern? Despite his own inner rage, Stygian almost admired the pony his perseverance. A rumble announced that Rockhoof had caught a decision in his patient head. I doubt it's a good first move, Beardy, but I nae back away from a fight neither. We face chaos, whatever we do. So if it comes to that, I say do it. Only if. Still not satisfied, Starsworld grunted and his bells jangled. Captain Magnus, tried and tested methods have failed us so far. Do you not talk of the whale threshold in the Pegasus army? Stygian heard the armor clank and guessed the soldier had saluted. Yes, sir. Old rule on the book, sir. Any threat serious enough to put the realm in the, cra in the toilet, sir? Pardon my minotaurian, sir. 
is beyond normal M.O. and anything used against it is justified, sir. And now, Captain Magnus? The pause wobbled. Then he said, Sir, I say the rem is well and truly in the toilet, sir. Hmm. As for you, Somnambula, wouldn't you seize any chance, however slim, of winning this war? I recall you weren't so reticent in the teeth of that sphinx, what? Her voice was a sickle. I trust there is a better way, Starswell debuted. Indeed, and Meadowbrook, ponies are dying. Stygian held his breath. Regardless of the dusk light itself dying outside the window, the room darkened far faster than it should have. Was that old sorcerer bullying a consensus out of them? What gave him the right to act like a king among subjects? Who does he think he is bullying my team? Yet slowly, hesitantly, the other ponies shuffled their hooves where they sat or stood. Beside him, Stygian heard the bar stallion quietly remove the stool Mistmaid had knocked over. Stygian watched them out of the corner of his eye. It was Mistmaid who stepped forwards. I cannot condone this course of action, Starswirl. You want to see them stopped, said Starswirl. I can stop them permanently. The limbo relocator spell is still experimental. Supposing you simply sent those monsters to another part of Equestria. They would return, and we would be lulled into a false sense of security. Another thunderclap smacked Stygian around the head. He threw it back and gripped his ears tightly between his hooves, gritting his teeth against the pain, hitting him over and over. Through eyes narrowed and hot, he saw the others groan and clutch their heads. Even Mistmane flinched. By the time the echoes stopped stinging, Starswell thumped the table. This is no longer just another war, he bellowed, spittle flying. Do or die. Star swirl, Miss Main reared up. This is getting out of hand. Exactly. The sirens are tearing our beloved country into pieces and you want to show them mercy? You want me to stand back and let them? Because that's all we'll accomplish if we do not aim higher than they do. Much higher. But Limbo... Star Swirl, I'm surprised at you. The place has too many terrible stories. Ponies who meddle in the affairs of other worlds all meet grisly fates. Open your eyes, Miss May. We are in a terrible story right now. We face a grisly fate even as we speak. But as soon as we send those brutes to limbo, the last seven years of our lives will all become a shadow of a nightmare. All of our fighting will have been worthwhile. Meadowbrook opened her mouth to speak. No, Meadowbrook. Think. Starswirl pointed at each of them, legs stiff as a cane. Think, everyone. Think of the lives we'd save if we sent those monsters to the depths of limbo for all eternity, where they could no longer hurt our fellow ponies. No, I have decided. This is too grave a situation for us to be timid any longer. The silence fell like an axe. Flash Magnus was the first to cough. Steady on, sir, he said, half chuckling. We're all on the same side here. Ot symbol stabunt, ot simul cadent. Rumbling, Rockhoof cast a sidelock glance at the long beard. You wanna sleep on it, beardy? Could be worth dreeing over a wee slumber. Just as Somnambula opened her mouth too, Meadowbrook raised her hoof to bar her. The healer's face fixed on star swirl giving him none of the warmth that had shone through before now. Her other forelimb picked up the tankard, which sloshed a little. All ears listened as she gulped the last of the brandy down. Then the tankard hit the table. Meadowbrook belched. It was a heck of a belch. Stygian felt it through his legs. The rafters groaned and one of them slid out of place. Let's sleep on it, every pony, said Meadowbrook. Tomorrow's gonna be the mama and papa battles, either way. I sure hope you're right, Starswell. But she glanced at Stygian when she spoke next. For your sake, sweetheart, I honestly wish you are as red as rain. Was there concern in those parting words? Stygian might have imagined it. In any case, she didn't stick around after that, but simply bustled towards the exit. Rockhoof shrugged and bent his head low to follow her out. 
Flash Magnus shrugged and flew out after them. And that left four. Somnambula nodded to each of them in turn, her mask of concern cutting through the dark outlines of her eyes. She flew out too, just not with the same vim and vigor Flash Magnus had. Then again, he hadn't looked so confident either. Behind the bar, the bar stallion watched the three remaining unicorns warily. Whatever goodwill he'd had obviously hadn't lasted. Not now, Meadowbrook was out the door. A gentle hoof met Stygian's shoulder. Mist Mane patted him, not unkindly, but definitely stiffer than usual. At least her wrinkled smile shone through like a shine on an apple before she looked back at Starswirl. Stygian didn't see her expression, fortunately or unfortunately. There was no clue from Starswirl either. His face remained inscrutable. The door creaked shut, leaving just the two unicorns. Oh, and last orders, gents, said the bar stallion. Leave us, bartender, was Starswirl's dismissive reply. Only I'm closing up the tavern now. Too late, Stygian closed his eyes. The flare forced him to blink out the after images. He almost leapt in panic. Bang! Stygian looked at the bar. The back of the tavern smoked heavily. Broken glass tinkled. Nervous eyes peered over the counter. The bar stallion had ducked. I said leave us, said Starswirl. I am asking politely. He really is, sir, uh, said Stygian to the nervous eyes. They darted off quick. Hoofsteps hurried out the back, whimpering. Stygian had never heard a big stallion whimper. It was quite an education. And then there were two. Part 7 Just the two of them now. Stygian watched the sorcerer to see where this was going. Behind him, the bar gently tinkled as it cooled down. Starswirl clearly still got it. Starswirl didn't speak right away. Instead, the room darkened around him. Stygian lit his own horn, a simple enough spell and one he'd learned early on in his studies. His classmates used it to sneak out at night. He used it to study it for as long as he could stay awake. The last minutes burned in his memory. How had he contributed so much and yet felt like a fool at a meeting of monarchs? How could he keep him on the side like a servant no one needed to notice? It was his plan, his ideas, his thinking. That had brought them together. So why was he always on the margins? Mad cheeriness seized his throat. Not going to sleep yet, sir? Starswell grunted. I see you have the same idea as me, though I suppose you have more reason. Sir? I wouldn't ask you to fight tomorrow, Stygian. All due respect, but fighting is not your special talent. It's not Meadowbrook's either, thought Stygian. She's only a healer, and I've never seen some Nambula land a kick. She uses her brain to win instead. So why single me out, you old hack? Strangely, the thoughts didn't worry him. They were his thoughts, after all. He agreed with them. But in his head, the thoughts seethed and bubbled and boiled, cooking out all goodwill out of the words and leaving his stomach full of spitting fire. To his astonishment, he watched Star Swirl slump on the seat. Sir? he said, summoning as much concern as he had left. They're losing hope, groaned Starswirl, wearing his ears not like a master, but like a shabby mule. Somnambula herself doubts me now. I can see it in her eyes. I'm sure they understand you, sir, said Stygian, far more happily than he felt. He'd seen Starswirl like this before. Seven years weighs heavily on a pony's heart, sir. Hearts. A mirthless chuckle died alone. Whatever Starswirl stared at, it was probably a lifetime away. Stygian cleared his throat. He really did keep this group together. It didn't matter if no one else pointed this out, or if he screamed about it in the privacy of his own head every other day. Duty compelled him to step in, over and over. Everyone's desperate, sir. 
Why, it wouldn't surprise me if they secretly agreed with your plan, sir. They just don't want to admit things are as bad as all that. Old age sighed with Starswirl, his constant companion. Neither do I, to be frank. There, we reach unanimous agreement. Another chuckle down in his beard. Now that's a rarity. And Stygian could read the old sorcerer like an open book. Still think of her, sir? Hmm? Oh, her. Yes. Starswell shifted on his seat. Under Stygian's beam, his face sank under the weight of long hairs and too many wrinkles, even worse than Miss Mains. Suddenly, Starswell sat up straight. Stygian. Yes, sir? You see further and hear more than these old eyes and ears of mine. What do the others think of me? Stygian immediately thought, lie, lie through your teeth. It's so much easier than making him angry, him who can transform ponies into pots as easily as ponies change horseshoes. Well, sir, he began. Heroes are always tricky, you see, said Starswirl, and Stygian thanked his lucky stars because the old sorcerer was in that kind of rambling mood. They aim high. They think they know best. They interfere all the time. Sir, said Stygian, who wisely refrained from commenting about star swirl relative to those complaints. Put more than one of them in the same room, and there's always something lacking. No checks, no balances, just lots of egos fighting for space. Ambition gets bigger, and that means everyone else's ambitions get bigger too. That's how you get monsters. Oh, sir said Stygian, honesty, taking full control. I'm sure the others are very kind and brave and humble ponies. Captain Magnus just wants to get the job done. He is a career soldier, sir. And Meadowbrook wants to heal the world, sir. She's the kindest soul it's ever been my pleasure to meet. Yes, yes, Stygian, you say that now. But now you've brought them together. They face each other more often than they face their enemies. That's why friends are more dangerous. Stygian's heart sank. He'd trodden down this road so many times. He'd always drowned under the secret guilt. Yet Starstwell's voice grabbed his mind and frog-marched it down a familiar path at the end of which lay shadows. Shadows that could hide anything. I don't agree, sir, said Stygian. Change the script. If only he could change the script. Yet again, Starswell ignored him. I had a friend once, promising young student, very interested in transformation spells, I remember. He frowned for a moment. Also fish. Sir, you don't have to say it. I know. One of the best and the brightest. She thirsted for knowledge, always pestered me, always asked me about this and that. Ambitious, oh yes. She worshipped the ground I walked upon and the air I breathed and, frankly, anything I ate or drank. Always copying my every move. Hope greatness would rub off on her, I suppose. When he blew out, dusts of beard flew up for a moment. Stygian couldn't resist any more. He just hoped the shadows didn't reach out and grab him. The others aren't like that, sir, he said, without hope. I know they aren't. They wouldn't betray anyone. How can you be sure? Sarsfield's whisper didn't have much hope left either. Around them, the smell of old beer followed up the breaths they took. So dark was the tavern that Sarsfield lit up his own horn and red rage caught in his face, the face of a demon. And once she had all she wanted from me, she was out the door in a fright. Fighting against age and weakness, Sarsfield growled. She was my friend, Stygian. Gave me gifts, answered every question I had. Fetched my ointment whenever one of my spells backfired. She told such jokes she did that even Meadowbrook would cringe to hear them. And she was out that door as soon as we were done. Gone. Stygian shivered. Without other ponies around, the warmth of the place seeped away. Darkness intensified around their two lights. He rubbed his mouth, which wanted another drink. Adagio was a long time ago, sir. Adagio is right now, Stygian. 
flying around out there, bringing somnambulous wretched siren legends to life. She liked the idea. She made it a reality. With my own magic. Now she flies around hunting lesser ponies. Not an ounce of unicorn left in her. And she found two more fools to join her desecration of everything I loved. That was all my friendship meant to her. My magic, my country, my... My... Stortzel's face woke up as though realizing the memory had been severed. Nothing beyond that word came to him. The demon returned to him, glaring, he muttered, The others will go the same way, if you're not careful. Lady Mistmain and the others? But after all the things they done, sir, surely we could give them the benefit of the doubt. You're young and simple, Stygian. You spent too much time locked away from the world. That gullible idealism will get you killed if you're not careful. You nearly killed me. Adagio was different, sir. Not everyone is like that. Clover was never like that. The other apprentice, oh yes. Stygian had never met her, but he liked the sound of her, and anything that stuck it to this fool was fine by him. Starswell bared his teeth. Nonsense. Clover abandoned me long ago. Did she, sir? I heard she traveled to help other ponies, sir. See, some ponies have their own special destiny. Like making real friends, Stygian thought. Are you contradicting me, young colt? In the silence, the demonic face of Starswell shifted. His hat shielded his eyes, but Stygian knew from experience the old stallion had narrowed them. Was he standing up to Starswell? What kind of question was that? A moment ago, Stygian hadn't even fought along those lines. He'd just imagined, say, Rockhoof's face if the stallion caught him talking like this. Rockhoof might look like an overgrown mutton head, but he knew denial when he heard it. Even if Rockhoof had possessed Brock's for brains, though, he didn't need them with Somnambula around. He pulled Stygian out of so many fires, snapped him out of so many trances. How could it be wrong to stand up for a hero like him, however much the big loudmouth made stories up about his exploits? With a shovel? And what about the others? Sitchin quailed and stayed quiet, but he couldn't let Starswell talk about them as though they were the enemy. As those wanting to smile among friends showed lack of moral fiber. Hypocrite. Starswell hadn't been so humorless during that stupid song earlier. But here and now, he was standing up to Starsworld, a little scholar like him. So he kept his mouth shut and shook his head, and something deep inside raged against his ribcage, toward his throat, burned and writhed in the agony of not being let free to right all the wrongs thrown back at his face. No, sir, he whispered. I apologize, sir. It wasn't my place to question your wisdom. He hated those words. Only, what else could he say? Starswell backed off, and that was that. Job done. A lie could keep his band of heroes from tearing itself apart. And it started with the sorcerer. Besides, where else was Stygian going to go? Back in his tower, Stygian had barely believed ponies like that were real. Rockhoof alone sounded like he'd stepped out of the sea of mythology. Until Stygian had first seen the mountain of Buck up close, it was impossible to believe an earth pony could throw boulders over a volcano or dig a valley out in one night. Plus, who else held a key to great power? Clover had disappeared off somewhere and no one else could even come close to Star Swirl. Perhaps he, Stygian, could learn more from the old sorcerer, find out how he became so strong. A thought struck him. You trust me. Don't you, sir? said Stygian. Of course. You're only a keen scholar, young colt. What harm can you be, after all? Stygian froze. The worst part was that Starstwell smiled like a grandfather, as though he just said something grand. Stygian dreamed of murder. For now, he faked a look of gratitude, head slightly bowed. Then he watched Starswell's horn light up. Of course, the stallion knew magic, why leave through the door like a common pony. 
A small bang rattled the planks, and then there was one. Stygian jutted his jaw at the empty spot. What harm could he be? Well now, one day he'd find out. Sirens would not leave him defenseless on the sidelines. Oh, no. Not if he found a way. Fear choked him. He forced a hoof into his face until all dreams of murder and smug smiles fell back into his heart. Safely contain it, that was the key. Never let the dream take over. Believe there was an end to all this, and that it would be a good one. He took a deep breath to steady himself. Then he headed for the door, hoofsteps pattering on the floorboards. Fear reached up and put his lights out. He didn't want to show up in the darkness. Besides, at night he felt calmer somehow, more real, as if the day was full of dreams and myths and stories all clamoring for attention around him, crushing him and suffocating him. Whereas the night? At night, he was his own stallion. No, he would not join the others tonight. Maybe he would scout ahead, go to hollow shades, make himself useful. He could leave the others there if he left signs along the route, marks in the trunks perhaps, or a few stones piled up in a certain way. He'd read guides on outdoor survival after all, and journals left by explorers. He knew he could do it, he only needed a chance. He pushed the door open. He had to. Sooner or later, he had to prove he was one of them. Worthiness had to be earned honorably. For now, he'd played the helpful sidekick, but one day, he'd play the hero. So Stygian smiled at his own quiet dreams, a cheers never heard and slaps on the back that for once felt earned and hearty. Lights in dark places, lights in dark times. He could be one of those lights. Modestly, he laughed under his breath and then bravery gave him strength and he stepped out into darkness. The End